नदी की भांति बहती भाषा जो देश समाज और संस्कृति की पहचान बने सदियों के इतिहास की साक्षी रहे वो भाषा विश्व में देश की पहचान बने कवियों लेखकों से लेकर डिजिटल दुनिया तक परचम लहराया वो हिंद की हिंदी भारत की शान बने आइए आज मनाए मिलकर हिंदी उत्सव अपनी भाषा का अपने सपनों का हिंदी है हम to welcome you to this session of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Detol Banega Swast India the session is presented by Amar Ujala it is our pleasure to present today i am a language i mark my passage with words that smell life that's all writes k sachidanandan one might ask them what is the language of life what is the language of my life its articulation that inspires a sense of resonance so or does the human condition transcend language k sachidanandan is a pioneer in modern malayalam poetry a bilingual literary critic and writer and the most translated malayalam poet in indian and european languages celebrated by diverse cultures and critics alike his remarkable anthology i am language features the translations of 100 distinguished poems originally written in malayalam he also writes extensively on the art of translation linguistic discoveries and the language question in conversation with malayalam poet and translator anita thambi k sachidanandan discusses the language of art and self amid a babel of voices k sachidanandan K Sachidanandan is a renowned poet, writer, critic, playwright and editor who has written extensively in English, Arabic, Irish, French, German, Italian, Spanish, Chinese and Japanese besides all major Indian languages. His latest books of poetry in English include While I Write, Misplaced Objects and Other Poems and Singing in the Dark among others. Sachidanandan is a recipient of 52 literary awards including the National Academy Award, Dante Medal from Italy and the Poet Laureate Award from Tata Literature Festival Bombay. Anita Thampi is a Malayalam poet who has been translated into many Indian and foreign languages. She has published four collections of poetry to significant critical acclaim. Her translations into Malayalam include writings of Juan Ramo Jimenez Carlo Collodi, Le Murray and Murid Bargoti. She lives in Tiruvannamthapuram, Kerala. Please feel free to send in your comments by typing them in the comment section. Do follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions. Please tweet using #jaipurliteraturefestival2022 and tag @jaipurlitfest. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a language. K. Sachidanandan in conversation with Anita Tham. K. Sachidanandan, one of the top line literary personalities in India today, does not need a general or passing introduction to the audience of this festival. Sachida, welcome back home. Yes, I am back home, and I am happy uh, to be here. I am in. I am living in a very very in village in a in a villa. Uh, so far from the madding crowds of the of uh, the city like Delhi, I feel uh, I feel a kind of quietude which I was uh, always looking for, which I couldn't never find in Delhi. So that way, I'm uh, quite happy about my return, and I hope that uh, my poetry also will be in some way refreshed by uh, this return. It will retrieve. some of my lost uh, dreams and uh, my you know uh, my lost abilities and perhaps give a new turn to my poetry who knows yeah that's what i was thinking too because you have been away from the land and the language for the last 30 years i mean away from the everyday experience of malayalam in the physical sense you have missed 
the immediate voices and the noises and the din and the dust of the language, your mother tongue. So you will be reinventing yourself with your language, let's hope. And uh, uh, that brings us to the theme of this conversation, the title of our conversation today, I am a language. It is also the title of one of your poems written as a reading of the painting by the surrealistic painter, René Marguerite. Uh, it, that was a poem, uh, it was a, an attempt to read, to capture the alphabets of a painter's language. I am a language, when you say I am a language, do you also suggest a poet having a signature language of her own or his own? Uh, yeah, indeed, I think uh, uh, we have several languages uh, uh, through which uh, uh, people speak. Uh, the painter, the sculptor, the architect, the dancer, the musician, and the poet. Uh, all of them are using, in some sense, different languages. The, si the, the signs are different, the structures are different, the syntax may be different again. But still, there is something that connects all the arts. I have always emphasized this kind of an intimate relationship among the different arts. As you very well know, I have written poems on musicians, poems on... Uh, painters uh, and poems on architectural monuments, uh, which I saw during my travels across the six continents. Uh, I have always felt a kind of very deep spiritual connect with uh, the artists who work in other media, especially painters and musicians and dancers. Uh, I, I think uh, these arts are very, very close to the art of poetry, even though we use uh, you know, different kinds of media to express ourselves. Uh, so that's why, uh, that's how this poem also happened. I was in Belgium and uh, uh, the first thing I wanted to see was the René Magritte Museum because I had read, uh, you know, this was a pipe uh, by Michel Foucault uh, on uh, René Magritte's art. And I wanted to see his paintings, uh, original paintings. And I went to the museum and spent a lot of time in the museum watching uh, the kind of uh, surreal paintings that he had made and through that, I felt when I was looking at his painting, I felt he was creating a new language. Each painting was, or each image in a painting was like a letter in an alphabet. So he was creating uh, a language of his own. And this is what actually artists do, and this is what uh, perhaps poets also do. Uh, you know, creating uh, a language within the language. Of course, there is a there is a universal language of painting, and there is a universal language of poetry. But within that. Uh, there are regional languages, and within the regional language, there are sub-languages, and within the sub-languages, again, each poet finds his or her own language by, uh, by the way in which, uh, you know, he or she uh, uh, brings words together. Uh, they often find a new syntax, and they often uh, create new structures of poetry, and that's how Poetry goes on changing from time to time. Um, you know, you know the well-known uh, essay by T. S. Eliot: uh, "Tradition and Individual Talent." It's a cliche to speak about it, but still, it's an important uh, essay. Uh, so each poet, through uh, his or her individual talent, uh, redefines tradition, reshapes tradition, and in that, language plays a major part because uh, because it is by changing language that the poet. Uh, makes language his or her own and also uh, remolds the entire tradition or traditions, I should say, uh, that he or she has inherited. Very true, Sachida. You are a language and at the same time, you are also many languages, aren't you? And let's come to your translations of poetry from there. Um, that by itself is a huge body of work. You have translated from all over the world and from other Indian languages throughout your writing life. And you have said that you do translations as a process of enriching the language, enriching your own writing, and also, uh, which I found very interesting, the third point, right, trying the strength of Malayalam as a language. Uh, do you see translations as an act of ultimate challenge in pushing or expanding poetic language in Malayalam? whether um, as a relatively young language, Malayalam can carry with strength and grace, great poetry from you know, other older languages like say Spanish or French or other languages. Yeah, translation, Anida, as you very well said, is also a way of testing the power of your language or the limits of your language, especially when you translate a very challenging poet 
uh, say like porcelain or Cesar Vallejo or even poets like Rilke or, or Baudelaire or Balame, uh, you are in fact trying to find out whether these poets uh, can be carried into or by your language. And, and, and I enjoy, you know, facing this challenge and trying uh, in that way, uh, pushing the limits of the language so that uh, the kind of experience that they are trying to convey, I mean, uh, both the life experience and the poetic experience can come into a language like Malayala, which is uh, relatively limited. I mean, compared to uh, maybe compared to German or compared to French, uh, maybe Malayalam is a smaller language. But can we, with our limited uh, vocabulary and our, our uh, you know, various kinds of uh, limitations of syntax, and maybe with a, an altogether different structure as a Dravidian language, can we uh, bring in, uh, you know, the, the, an indo aryan or a, a Germanic language like German uh, into Malayalam or other European languages uh, into Malayalam. So this, I think, is a major test. And uh, uh, I, I, I enjoy doing translations also because it's the kind of challenge. Every line is a challenge. Every image is a challenge. Every association and every memory is a challenge because we don't have many of those associations. We don't have many of the memories that many of these poets had. And so uh, uh, each line and each image and each uh, suggestion becomes a kind of challenge for the poet. And also often you have to change the arrangement of the lines because your language uh, is uh, different in grammatical structure. Uh, and, and so you are actually remolding your own language by looking at another poet and by trying to translate uh, his or her poetry. So I think I think that is a major contribution that translation does to uh, language, especially poetic language. And, and, and it is a kind of gift uh, which I give or every translator gives to the younger generation. Because you have a language which is more enriched, more empowered, a language which can uh, carry you know, heavier and different kinds of experiences. And uh, so uh, I generally I advise young poets when they come for me uh, for advice. I first say that I am I'm not capable of advising anybody because I always consider myself a beginner uh, before before the empty paper. I am I, I always feel helpless like a beginner. But even then, what has actually helped me uh, if they ask I ask me, I say uh, uh, several things, of course, observation of nature, observation of your own life and your own inner life, the study of language. And along with, along with that, I also tell them, try translating some of the best known uh, poems uh, from any other language that you very well know. And that uh, you may not publish those translations, not necessary, because I have not published my early translations, which I did in school and uh, college as a student, uh, because I translated a lot of Rumi, I translated Omar Khayyam, uh, I translated the British Romantics, uh, but this I have, I have never published them. Uh, but so I tell uh, the young poets also to try translating, then you will be able to know your own limits the limits of your language and sometimes even to cross the limits of your language which may be necessary even when you write your own poetry uh, because you have an experience which has never been articulated uh, you know completely before and so uh, uh, this experience of translation will somehow empower you and help you you know understand language better and also uh, improve your own capabilities as a as a creative uh, imaginative writer very true, Sachita. Uh, I remember you have initiated, uh, you, were, you have initiated me, interested a lot of translation works, uh, which uh, you know, initiated me into the world of uh, translation. Uh, but I was thinking we always reach other language world poetry through their English translations. We stumbled twice over before reaching anywhere near the original. And also in translation, we always struggle with the rhythms and the music and the cadences and the highly referential historical and cultural resonances that are mostly lost on the one side. And then there are the larger human experiences and the values that transcend. So on the one side, there is a rootedness of a poem that resists translation. And on the other side, there is uh, its universality that is transported in translation. How have you experienced it? Yeah, this is exactly what makes a translation also a playful activity. It is a challenge, a very heavy challenge, 
but it is also extremely playful uh, because you are also playing uh, you know a, a, an instrument with which you are not very very familiar uh, and so when you try to translate you try to understand uh, first uh, the uh, uh, the the language from which you translate and very often as you very well said it is a secondary translation like the translations i have done from spanish or german or slovenian or many languages i do not know even though i have most often tried to compare my translation with the original sometimes you i translate a whole lot of swedish poetry sitting with the swedish poets we seldom use the uh, english i mean uh, we had to use the minimum english but with that they would explain to me each line each image each reference and that was a great 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 experience and when my poems are first translated into hindi uh, you know of course i i have some kind of uh, some knowledge of hindi but i had also uh, and it was translated by a hindi poet who did not know malayalam at all so but we managed it and also we had a third person who helped us somebody who knew hindi and malayalam equally well and that i found was a wonderful working model for uh, uh, for translation so uh, and, in, and in the case of spanish poetry i have always uh, compared it with the original first of all i try to translate as far as possible from a bilingual edition so that i have a spanish origin a uh, spanish original and so i understand a bit of it because of my uh, because I, i have specialized in old english and old english has a lot of latin and Ge and germanic grammar in it and even verbs uh, many many verbs in spanish i can directly understand but i also help the seek the help of a scholar who knows spanish uh, really well and i try to uh, sit with him or her and compare uh, the translation with the real original without uh, being mediated by english uh, which, uh, from which often i make the first draft of my translation many i have done like this and i have done this uh, with bengali i have done this with hindi and i have done this with a few other languages like french always i tried to uh, to compare the poem uh, with the original and i also found sometimes uh, uh, you know my, uh, malayalam translations could be better than english translations you know if you really look at the original and the translation you can be sometimes even more faithful especially this is true about the median languages you know uh, you know they come very easily into malayalam unlike the european languages which may be hard to carry uh, into malayalam so uh, so it has been an enriching uh, very thrilling and at the same time extremely challenging and difficult kind of experience and that, that has really helped me as a poet Uh, such is the most uh, multilingual poets write poems in their mother tongue they write their other writings prose for example in acquired languages you also write your poetry in malayalam uh, but at the same time uh, you know while you you have this experience of being bilingual or being multilingual in your writing uh, don't you also think that in today's world world made smaller by new technologies and social media the very idea of mother tongue also has changed you are very right uh, uh, for for various reasons because uh, i i have met a lot of young people who don't have a mother tongue uh, or who are unable to say which is uh, his or her mother tongue uh, you know um, uh, there, there are several poets uh, who were born in some other country so uh, maybe maybe he or she was born in france and uh, uh, so uh, he or she grew up in uh, the french language surrounded by the french language studied in the french schools or colleges uh, and so uh, he or she uh, maybe the person is a malayali somebody from kerala uh, but uh, the person does not uh, uh, cannot claim uh, that malayalam is uh, his or her mother tongue uh, maybe uh, he or she uh, knows uh, i i'll use he from now because it is becoming a little difficult to use always she please understand whenever i say he it is also she so uh, so he uh, claim uh, he uh, cannot claim malayalam to be the mother tongue uh, because he knows french much better than malayalam and this is true about several uh, people of the younger generation whose parents had migrated uh, you know uh, years ago into other parts of uh, of the world and uh, any you very well know uh, that uh, malayalis are uh, uh, all over the globe and so when i speak to these second generation people i often realize that uh, they uh, well they know their mother tongue is malayalam if, if you if you press they will say it is malayalam but if you try to find out uh, 
uh, whether they are able to actually understand Malayalam, speak Malayalam, read or write Malayalam, you find, no, they often, often cannot. And so it becomes a kind of tourist place. You know, I had this experience in the United States once. Uh, some students were asked to speak about Kerala. They were Malayalis, but they spoke about Kerala uh, like tourists do. It's a beautiful place. It is green. It is full of rivers, you know. So, and similarly, uh, the, uh, the language also becomes part of a landscape observed by a tourist rather than somebody who was born and brought up there. So there is a kind of alienation. And so it is very true that it is very hard to say uh, which exactly is your mother tongue in the case of uh, several people. And also, as you said, there are many people who shift, you know, uh, between languages. You know, Ramanujan uh, would uh, uh, translate from Tamil, write poetry in Kannada and also write poetry in, uh, uh, in, in English. Uh, he would also write all his scholarly academic uh, uh, essays in English. So sometimes we also keep shifting between languages. And I have been doing uh, throughout my life uh, this kind of a shifting. I would try to write a poem in Malayalam. And if I feel that it can be translated, only then I try to translate that into English. So, uh, so I can claim to be in some sense bilingual. Uh, I mean, even though I may not be completely bilingual, yes, I am quite, uh, quite bilingual. And that's why, you know, all the, uh, many of the anthologies of uh, Indian English poetry carry my poems. I, uh, once when uh, Jeet Tail wanted to include my poems in his anthology, I asked him, uh, why do you include me? I am a Malayalam poet. But he said, no, not only he, several other editors also said, no, uh, you are a bilingual poet for us. Uh, because you translate your own poetry, we consider your poems also to have been rewritten a, a, in English. So this is the kind of change that seems to be happening, uh, not only uh, in Kerala or in India, but uh, all over. There are people traveling, people moving places, people migrating from one land to another. And then the language also some way, some way, in some way gets impacted by uh, that, uh, that change from one country to another, uh, from one place to another. Uh, Sachid, I have with me your very well-known poem, Stammer. Let me yeah. read it now. It would be appropriate uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the theme of our conversation. Stammer. Stammer is no handicap. It's a mode of speech. Stammer is no handicap. It's a mode of speech. Stammer is the silence that falls between the word and its meaning. Just as the lameness is the silence that falls between the word and the deed. Did stammer precede language or succeed it? Is it only a dialect or a language itself? These questions make the linguist stammer. Each time we stammer, we are offering a sacrifice to the God of meanings. When a whole people stammer, Stammer becomes their mother tongue, just as it is with us now. God too, God too must have stammered when he created man. That is why all the words of man carry different meanings. That is why everything he utters from his prayers to his commands stammers like poetry. In fact, this poem speaks with its stammer uh, it makes a good part of our discussion even unnecessary. It answers itself as a poem. And this brings to my mind, whenever I read this, the poem brings to my mind an image of language as a, as a being, a living creature. And I think of its gait and gestures and silences, of the pauses, of the hesitations and absences it has. Um, how do you think such gestures and silences work in the language of poetry? Yeah, I, I believe poetry is made as much with silence as with language. Uh, uh, because uh, the silences, the gaps, the leaps from one stanza to another or one from, from one line to another. So we leave a lot of things in between unsaid. And the unsaid is a very necessary and essential part 
of what we are trying to say. And that is where actually the reader comes in. So actually we are leaving certain gaps or doors or windows for the readers to come in. And then the readers come in and interpret those silences and fill those silences with their own memories and their own experiences, including their own experience of language. And that is how a poem becomes complete. A poem is a poem uh, that a poet writes is never complete. It is completed when a reader uh, uh, you know, reads the, the poem and then tries to understand, interpret, uh, uh, you know, it in, in his or her own way. And thus uh, to, uh, uh, to add to the poem their own experience of having read the poetry before, many poems, uh, whatever poems they have read before, and, the, and also their own life experiences. I, as I said, their memories, their dreams, their their ideas of poetry, their ideas of aesthetics, all these somehow come into their reading of uh, uh, the poem, and that's how a poem gets completed. Always, it's a, I mean, um, it's a, it's the writing done by at least two people, the writer and the reader, and the, so the reader has a very central kind of role uh, in uh, in creating a poem. The, uh, the 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 poet provides a way. Uh, but then the reader fills the gaps and silences and makes it uh, uh, complete. So the silences are very necessary. So suggestions and silence. So it's all said and done. Still, every language, language of the state, language of judiciary, political parties, media, art, literature, all languages are different manifestations of the language of power. For people from the margins, it still is essentially an upper caste, upper class male with a mustache and money. So I know that your poetry has always been aware of this and alert on this aspect. And you are the only Malayalam poet, I would say, other than Kumar Nashan, who has written as a woman, not just from the female perspective, but writing as a woman. And you have also written in a poem titled, Awal Ulli, The She in Me, that you have a woman within you. You have, in a way, used language to transcend gender and have tried to, uh, well, I wouldn't say demasculinize, but you have tried to feminize the language to some extent. Uh, uh, used language as a tool to transcend gender. Uh, yes, I earlier said I am somewhat bilingual. And now I should add, I am also, in some sense, bisexual. Uh, because uh, when, when I write uh, uh, a poem, about a woman's life, I actually become that woman. It could be, uh, you know, recently I wrote a poem on sex workers, uh, a sex worker speaking as a, as, as a kind of uh, data of our times. Uh, so, uh, and earlier uh, you have already spoken about uh, she inside me. And there are quite a few poems, uh, you know, there are, uh, there are poems like uh, Kayatam, the, the Ascent. There are poems like Inyun Vishramikate, Let Me Now Take Some Rest. So in, in many of, and there are quite a few other poems, as you very well Even know. Even Andal Pranayate. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Andal, Andal, the Tamil. <laughs> Andal, the, yes, Andal, the Tamil, uh, you know, uh, Vaishnavite poet uh, uh, speaking about love. Uh, so, uh, so I have tried to be, because I believe that, you know, gender is it's true. Externally, I am a man and you are a woman. And this is true about many. And there are transgenders too. But a poet is basically a transgender, or or maybe a poet uh, is neither a woman nor a man. This this used to be said about the great uh, rishis and the you know the, the 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 great masters of meditation. And this is partly at least true about poets. We are born into a particular sex as we are born into a religion, and uh, all the, all these I consider it to be an accident. But if if birth is an accident. That you are born as a, a man or a woman is also an accident. I very much an accident, like as you are you are born into a Hindu family or a Christian family. So I don't think we should idolize that or idealize that and imagine that okay, you are born a man and you have to always play the part of uh, the, the macho man. So that is where many uh, many many men obviously and and even many poets go wrong. No. I'm, uh, there, there is always a woman in me, as I, as, as in that poem I say, I, I used to stand before the mirror and dance, and my even my mother 
uh, used to scold me for for that. You are a boy. Why are you standing before the mirror and singing and dancing and decorating yourself like a girl? So that girl is there. That girl is very much there uh, in me, in my language, in my poetry. So lang so that is how language transcends gender. So there is a gendered language. I don't uh, contradict that at all. Uh, but in somewhere, language also transcends gender. And so that is why we, we can enjoy a poem by Kamala Das or by Sylvia Plath or Anna Ahmadova or Anna Ahmadulina or whoever. I mean, uh, all, all these major uh, poets writing in English or Polish or other languages. Uh, by, by even, even remain, I am a man. Uh, so uh, if they were do, do, uh, doing something completely different, I should not be able to enjoy their poetry, but I'm able to do that. And if I can do that, why can't I become a girl or a woman and uh, you know write uh, a woman's poem, a, a girl's poem? I, I believe it is possible because human mind, I don't think, is uh, that gendered. I, I, so uh, because it is true, human body is gendered. You, you have no escape from these uh, laws of biology. But then your mind is not gendered. At least you you have the ability to transcend that uh, gender and the various kinds of impositions, social impositions of that gender on your uh, on your mind, on your thought, on your behavior, on your gesture. Like uh, man should not weep, man should not be weak. Uh, so I. I contradict all that i weep when i am sad i i i have i i express my feelings unashamedly and so i think uh, all of us have the capacity all all women have the ability to be to imagine they are men and all men have the ability to imagine they are women but unfortunately they shy away from that great uh, possibility of changing their gender yeah. perhaps we should look at gender as a spectrum rather than a binary and uh, you know, yes. we can place ourselves uh, at different points de depending on the context uh, you have also extensively written and spoken about the threats of the fascist forces right wing politics and the hindutva politics in india right from the 80s itself a time when its perils were not yet widely manifested like it is now now we experience the occupation of language by right wing fascist forces it's twofold in a way one to decontextualize language and create wrong meanings and thus cancel its ethical content two to mask off the multiple dimensions of language and reduce it to its literal meanings thus cancelling the historical resonances uh, don't you think this occupation of language can be best confronted and resisted through language itself both in poetry and in everyday life yeah, definitely, because language is one of the first things that gets colonized when a hegemonic class or a hegemonic ideology takes over. They, I mean, uh, when, uh, they, they, when they come to govern a country, it is language that is first affected. I remember I even recently quoted George Steiner, uh, the great uh, you know uh, critic who, uh, who is famous for especially two books, Language and Silence and The Tower of Babel. Uh, the second is about translation. And in Language and Silence, he says that several German poets ran away from Hitler's Germany. And what they said was not that they were running away to save their lives. They might not have been killed even if they remained in Germany, but to save their language. Because they found their, their, the, the marrow of their language was getting filled with lies, with a dishonesty. And so the, uh, the, the fascists, uh, uh, the, one of the first things that fascists do is to create a kind of meta language or a counter language where everything means the opposite. So today, for example, a traitor is actually somebody who really loves freedom, loves the country, loves the people, fights for the people. And such a person is called a traitor and often arrested under the sedition law. Look at the people who have been arrested under the sedition law. They are some of the greatest patriots in this country who have been fighting for the poor people, fighting for basic human rights. And, so, and, 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 and a word like terrorist is another example. So there are, there are there's a whole lexicon out there, a fascist lexicon, where every word means the very opposite. They call themselves patriots while they are actually harming the country. They are turning a lot of people into foreigners, into the other. 
and they are trying to drive them away and how can such a, such a, a group of people claim to be patriots because our country is our country because it is so varied you know we have so many languages so many cultures so many ways of communicating things uh, so many regional celebrations and uh, uh, so uh, many religions and it is all this together uh, that uh, yeah, that uh, that uh, creates my my india uh, it is not a, it's not an india where only aryans can uh, flourish or hindus uh, in in quote can flourish but it is an india where the hindu and the muslim and the parsi and the jain and the buddhist uh, and, and the christian uh, uh, they have all contributed to the making of indian india as a civilization and if you drive a, a, a many of them away and call them foreigners call, make them the other it means you are killing india and then you call yourself a patriot it is like calling the murderer uh, you know a great hero like like they do uh, god say uh, the, the the day uh, god say killed gandhi he celebrated as a, as belida and divas as a day of the uh, you know of somebody who sacrificed himself uh, to save the country uh, i mean uh, by by killing gandhi so uh, that is how, what they do uh, in language so fascism and any kind of authoritarianism actually first expresses itself in language the first signs appear in language and then of course uh, it begins to spread like a disease and it you know it uh, covers the whole country it kills the whole country the spirit of the country the spirit of the civilization tradition history everything as you said they decontextualize dehistoricize uh, language and so language is important that is how why language becomes important also in 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 politics i i have a story in mind which i don't have the time to say you know louis aragon the french writer uh, you know who was a poet and also uh, a, a short story writer wrote a story about a, a, about somebody who hated politics he never wanted to meet politicians he hated the word politics but then uh, he had a, a kind of paralysis which made uh, by, by which he lost his power of language and he had only one word which he could speak it was politics and by expressing by using that word you know in different tones uh, he had to express everything he, for, from his basic needs to his cultural needs so this is an extremely meaningful story especially in the context of uh, fascism every discussion we have we are discussing poetry and suddenly uh, politics comes in because we were discussing language so uh, so there is a kind of politicization of the entire discourse uh, that happens uh, especially when uh, there is a hegemonic authoritarian ideology that uh, seems to be uh, spread like a disease in the whole country very true sachida even you were you know most powerful for political writing i have found it very personal anyway let's we are coming to the end of the conversation soon so let me let me ask you about the current scenario in the context of new technologies and communication networks like social media issues like migration desperate migrations then our new uncertainties like the pandemic isolation of people and communities climate change and even now the new war what are your major concerns in confronting the changing world through the poetic language is is not there a tension a certain heaviness being developed in the language of the world the language of art and literature world over yeah in fact there is a kind of crisis and fortunately all crises have also been moments of creativity you know like uh, we often uh, you know uh, critics say that the worst times are the best times for the artist you know uh, will there will there be poetry uh, you know in bad times yes there will be poetry about bad times as bertolt brecht said so poetry survives bad times but sp by speaking about the bad times by by making it the the very central theme of poetry and this is true about art so it's a tragic time but we draw our strength not only from joys but also from uh, from the sadness from uh, personal sadness as well as uh, you know uh, the sadness uh, that seems to envelop us uh, all around uh, like uh, again uh, bertolt brecht said there are so many pleasures i know in the world but it is the pains that uh, drive me to my writing table this is true about me this is true about you this is perhaps true about all uh, uh, you know uh, important writers and artists so it is a challenge it's a crisis but it is also a moment of uh, uh, growth for creative minds and creative imagination 
Sachira, would you like to read uh, one short poem, maybe the unwritten poem? You have it with you? Uh, yes, I do have. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very short poem. I read with that. The unwritten poem. I am the poem. No one has written yet. I traveled up to the fingertips of many poets, but retreated to the dream like unexpressed love, as I was without script. I am not afraid of language, as long as it has a future tense. I am not afraid of language, as long as it has a future tense. One day I will find my words. A wonderstruck child will see a sail unfold and rise slowly on a vacant page under a new star. One day I will find my words. A wonderstruck child will see a sail unfold and rise slowly on a vacant page under a new star. So that is also a poem of crisis and a poem of hope. As long as there is a future tense, there is hope. Thank you, Sachida. Thank you for this beautiful conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Annie, for the meaningful questions which draw me into all these uh, thoughts and answers. Thank you. Thank you, K. Sachidanandan and Anita for a riveting conversation. The session is presented by Amar Ujala. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Please stay logged on to continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that have been specially curated for you. Sessions are ongoing across all three of our venues, Frontlawn, Bank of Baroda Mughal Tent and Darbar Hall. Stay tuned for the next session. Mm -hmm.